Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Think Big Bodybuilding Media here on YouTube. Advice is radio if you're listening on audio. Thank you, everyone, for liking and subscribing and following along with everything that we are doing. Today's program comes to us under very unfortunate circumstances. This program will be dedicated to uh, a bodybuilder that we recently lost, and that's IFBB Pro Daniel Alexander. Daniel was getting ready for Legion Sports Fest. He was going to compete in the 212 division. He sat down and recorded this podcast with us. And then, unfortunately, a couple days later, he shockingly passed away. He had turned pro 2017 as a middleweight. And he had climbed his way up to about 200 pounds now. And he looked fantastic. He was going to be a threat at this show, I believe. I know that his coach Dave was really proud of him. I know that uh, we were all looking forward, including him. I could tell, you know, he was freaking pumped. You know what it's like being just a couple weeks out and and being excited to to see all of your hard work come together. From what we understand, it looks like this was a heart issue. I can't really comment on the specifics, but there's a really good chance that this had some genetic underlying causes. Could bodybuilding have pushed that further through the stress of dieting and cardio and prep and work? I, I don't know. We don't know yet. But what we do know is that we lost a fantastic human being who was doing a lot for the sport of bodybuilding. So there's not much more I can say about this other than I, I didn't plan on putting this show out. Uh, then his parents reached out. They said they'd like to see the footage. And after that, they asked if we would still please put the program out. And so we are doing that today. And uh, I, uh, I just want to send a message out to his family and his friends that uh, I am really sorry for your loss. I hope you guys enjoy this program. Uh, there's some good bodybuilding stuff in here. Every time we get Dave Kalik on, it's always a good show. Guys, uh, beyond the bodybuilding stuff, I mean, the way I'm seeing this, I'm, you know, I'm looking for a lesson. And I keep coming back to the fact that we don't know when our time will be and all we have is now. And so I challenge you today to, to live your fullest life, do something new, do something different, do the things that you want to do because this is our only opportunity. My heart and my thoughts go out to Daniel, go out to his family, go out to his friends and, uh, and anybody who had the pleasure of knowing him. All right, guys, let's get to this show and uh, a lot more to come from Think Big and Advices. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Advices Radio and Think Big Bodybuilding Media on YouTube. Today, of course, we've got back with us Coach Dave Kalick, and he's brought with us IFBB Pro Daniel Alexander. What is up, gentlemen? Daniel, nice to meet you, brother. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. Nice to meet you. How's everything? Everything is good. So, uh, you know, I've been looking at your stuff. Of course, I've been following along with all the posts that Dave has made. And uh, just to take us back, now you turned pro at USA's as a middleweight, uh, 2017, correct? Yeah. All right. And what did you right. what did you weigh at that time on stage? Uh, what did we end up weighing? Like 75.8. Like it was actually yeah, pretty close. Like on the dot of like 75.8, like that wins. Right on, right on. And uh, now you are getting ready currently for uh, Legions, which is going to be, how far out are we now, Dave? Four calendar weeks from today. 28 days, exactly. All right, so four weeks out. Uh, Daniel's on a keto day, from what I gathered before we started recording here. And, uh, and, and what are you weighing today, brother? This morning before cardio, I weighed 200.8. Well, yeah, so that's a decent amount of muscle that you've put on. Uh, and that's really a, a lot of what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. You know, a lot of our listeners out here, viewers are, uh, you know, they're, everybody's trying to gain as much muscle as they can, be the best they can, bring their best physique. And uh, Dave, you guys have done one hell of a job. So I want to say, you know, congratulations to both of you already. I mean, for that's, that's a freaking ton of mass. Um, where do you figure he's going to come in on stage, Dave, this year? Honestly, like his weight fluctuates up and down. So, like, I mean, pretty much we have literally maybe a pound, and a half, like maybe a pound to lose at this point. You know, the idea is to be ready early. You know, the weight fluctuates, fluid loading, blah blah blah. When all said and done, he'll probably wind up going on stage 
I would imagine probably like I would say 197 on the dot. Um, and that's probably going to be pretty accurate. And what's kind of cool is that, again, you know, you won middles, it's 175. He did leave his last year, it's 188. And he's definitely on schedule to be 198 up there. Um, and there's more tissue everywhere, literally. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. What have you guys been doing, Daniel? Tell me about uh, what, do you, what do you think in your mind, first of all, has been the number one a uh, factor here in being able to put on the amount of muscle that you have. Well, if, if we go back to, to after I turned pro, um, I went right from that show. We started prepping for the first show and I, I don't know if Dave's told you or not, but I do cheerleading outside of this too. So I do a lot of tumbling and flipping and I, I compete doing that. So I've always had to keep my weight kind of in check. So that way, if I get with what else I do, I can't be too, too heavy. Um, so I've only been able to put on a little bit of weight every year, but this last year I was put in a situation where I didn't have to do as much. So I got to actually grow a little more and put on a little more size and working where I work. Um, I'm literally up and moving for 12, 13 hours so I can get a lot more meals. And I was doing maybe seven meals a day no in the off season. And so when you say working where you work, you're at uh, crunch. You're, you're one of the head trainers at what, what location yet? The Northridge location. Okay, right. I mean, and dude, I had no idea you did cheerleading. You know, Mike Libertori, he used to be a cheerleader too. That's right. Yeah, yeah he did. Huh. I forgot about that. I forgot about that shit. That's right. I think you guys are the only two uh, cheerleaders that I know of that have crossed the body. <laughs> Man, how have you, tell me about that. Cause this is seriously, this is something I didn't know anything about. When did you get into cheerleading? Um, I lost a bet when I was like 22. <laughs> You're kidding me. <laughs> yeah, I had to go to practice with a friend. I did a little bit in high school, but like just kind of like most football players do like their end of the year. They just kind of dick around to hang out with the girls. But uh, later I lost a bet with a friend. I had to go to his practice at the community college and uh, ended up liking it. So then I just stuck with it for a little bit. And here I am eight years later, still doing it. No kidding. Now, when you, as you've grown muscle, have you found that it, is it any more difficult to be like as agile as you need to? Oh, hell yeah. Really? I, I don't flip really as good as I used to. <laughs> no, there's no way. No kidding. So Dave, tell me, how does that affect his, uh, his bodybuilding? Cause it sounds like he's a really active dude between cheerleading, being I mean, a trainer, it's, working honestly, all day. It's pretty, like you got to see, uh, if you see like his, um, some if you go to his page, some of like, he's like tossing his curls up on his twirling them on his pinkies and shit. I respect the professionalism. Um, it hasn't really gotten the way of, you know, I mean, I'm sure that the added size has gotten, you know, the other way around, it's gotten in the way of what he's doing mechanically with the cheerleading, but the bodybuilding, I mean, if anything, Jesus Christ, I think it's made his interior and medial belts even crazier, you know? <laughs> Very deliberate moving, you know, you're pushing people up over your head and all that, and, um, you know, it hasn't affected the bodybuilding at all. Um, you know, I think the uh, biggest thing has been, you know, the increase of calories. If we're going back to the size that's been put on um, since last year. Had a really good off-season, went right into it. I mean, actually, we did utilize, I think, the size gains, like, we did utilize some good momentum uh, with rebounds, like, after each of these shows. And again, you know, we're talking about someone who's a genetic freak. You know, um, when he was middleweights, you know, like the first year he got fifth, making weight wasn't a problem. Um, the second year he got third, more challenging for sure, you know. And then the last year when he won, it was a motherfucker getting down. Um, you know, he was yeah. my chat every day and all that. <laughs> that was tough, bro. Yeah, that was tough. I'm not gonna lie, that was uh, that was one of the that was brutal. Um, but, you know, I think that left him in a situation where he was able to be very sensitive for a really good rebound, you know. And then we get to the 212 class, and again, there's no weight restriction. But yet, again, for him, he's unique in a couple of ways. So he gets very sensitive when he's very, very lean. And so during the prep, he grows. So he puts on more – most of the muscle I think Daniel puts on is actually in prep. Um, he's one of these guys that respond like where – you know, certain people have different um, sensitivity, you know, and some people have to be very lean to have that IGF acknowledgement to muscle cells where their sensitivity, where the, you know, higher levels of glucose, all this, everything is like stimulating growth, you know, where some people, they thrive on being like, you know, t huge caloric surplus, getting a little bit, you know, putting on five pounds of fat to put on 12 pounds, you know, he's not like that, he's actually the opposite where he just he just adds tissue 
as he gets leaner, so it's funny because, you know, as the time goes on, he's getting leaner and leaner, but the last, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, but the last six weeks, there really hasn't been any real loss, last five weeks, any real loss truly to scale. Hmm. It's just that his body, he gets leaner. I mean, a pound of lead weighs the same as a pound of feathers. So, I mean, he loses a pound of fat and retains a pound of muscle. It doesn't say the same, but it, it gets leaner and harder, leaner and harder. So, shit, man, this, this prep has been... Because of that, it's just been off the fall. Pretty great prep, actually. I mean, so much yeah. good things. A lot of it's how I eat in the off season too. I eat six, seven meals, but they're not, you know, they're not chicken and rice meals like most bodybuilders. I'll have like two granola bars or an egg McMuffin. That's a meal for me. And then um, when I started prep this year, I weighed 214 the first day we started the new diet. And right now I'm at 200, but I'm down, you know, 10% body fat. Damn. That's crazy, man. So, so realistically, then it sounds like if you're only eating a couple of granola bars, um, you know, in your off season for a meal at this point, then I take it like, I mean, how, first of all, let me ask you, uh, how far out do you start dieting for a show? Uh, this year we started what, 18 weeks, 16 weeks. Yeah. Just earlier because for, for many reasons, I mean, his metabolism so fast. Um, and here's a situation where because when he gets into uh, like a more of a caloric deficit, you know, it seems like he thrives in response to that. Yeah. And then as the calories progressively like, you know, come up, then he just seems to respond and just grows, you know? I mean, really? I mean, at this point, you know, we do have, um, you know, some keto days, gluconeogenic days, you know, some car free ones. But for the most part, uh, for this prep, I mean, his calories have been they're way higher compared to last year. I mean, he's got a lot more muscle on him. So the calories are, you know, appropriately placed in lieu of that. Yeah. Well, let me ask you something, Dave, if he were to uh, eat like that year round, I mean, what do you, what do you think? Do you think that he would be even bigger then if he were to be no, able I to think he'd go crazy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, I mean like this next season, this off season will be a little bit different, but I mean, initially like, you know, his appetite, what happens is his appetite gradually, like in the beginning of prep, his appetite is not like, you know, amazing. And then not, I'm not saying the meals are forced, Yeah. but it takes a little bit for the wheels to get churning. And then all of a sudden he gets hungry between meals, you know, and then They're all of a sudden, forced. You know, I'm forcing a lot of those meals in the beginning. No kidding. Yeah. So getting like, the, ironically, I think the toughest part for him is the first couple of weeks of prep, just getting in that, huh. that mode, you know, cause it's actually, you know, he's, he's eating more, there might be some more calories in the off season, but he's eating more volume of food you know, in the, in the pre-contest phase. And that takes some getting used to, but it's like, you know, my analogy of, uh, you build up a fire with kindling and then, you know, there's a good flame going and then you put these big logs on and the flame diminishes. But once those logs catch fire, you know, my stupid analogies, but anyway, once he gets going, his metabolism gets going and things start picking up and then he's hungry for the next meal. And then lo and behold, he'll be starving for the next meal. And then he becomes grumpy. And then I know when he's grumpy, we're getting there. <laughs> so, Right uh, I'm getting grumpy, so we're it's a keto day. A little grumpy. What does the day look like for you today on, on keto? Like, how, what, what are we talking exactly? Oh, let them let, rip it out. Tell them what we're doing today. Uh, breakfast was four fish and three whole eggs, and then I did four fish, four beef, and then I did have eight chicken, and then at four o'clock I'll do another four fish, four beef, and then I'll do another eight ounces of chicken, and then dinner is egg whites and fish. So Dave likes to mix those proteins together. How do you how do you feel you've responded to doing that? Because I know that's something we've talked about a bunch of times. It's not just eight ounces of chicken. It's not just eight ounces of steak. You like you're saying you're doing like four and four in some of these meals. It makes a big difference on how everything digests. You can feel a difference. You feel your metabolism get warmer. You feel your body get warmer. Uh, mixing the proteins definitely makes a difference in how your body is reacting to everything. Right on. Right on. Now. Um, so are you guys now, I know, Dave, you work with Stan Physique Inc. Are you guys all working as a team together or are you just working one on one with Daniel? I pretty much work one on one. Stan has definitely helped out a great deal with uh, his posing. Stan is literally one of the best posers, you know, ever. So, you know, I do the diet and the prep and all that. And we have Stan work on his posing at times. And it's been extremely helpful. Right. On. What's your favorite part of, uh, of doing all this, Daniel? Um, probably the sense of accomplishment. Um, this is something that I wanted to do since I was 13, 14, pretty classic bodybuilder story. 
Um, I can tell you the magazine that I saw when I decided I want to look like that and uh, just making it happen. Finally, you know, I, I took a little break to finish college and there was a couple of years where I didn't really get to computer work out like I wanted to. And then I just hopped right back into it. Right on. And how old are you now? Uh, I turned 30 this year. Right on. It's a good age, Dave. This is like the age where guys really start maturing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, between 30 and 38 is where I think the real meat and potatoes happen. And then of course, it's kind of cool because I think um, I see a lot of changes in physiques, obviously, from 30 to 38. But then, like, there's also, like, you know, we can go talk about it another time. Between 38 and 40, there's just different levels of change, you know, different levels of maturity, muscle maturity, whatever. But um, I think uh, for next year, you'll see Daniel probably for the first time, it'll be a struggle making the 212 class, not mm-hmm. unlike it was a struggle making the middleweight class. And I'm sure that's what's going to happen next year. Just at the rate he's growing. I mean, honestly – even now, like he wanted to, like he could, you know, we want the muscle to look, you know, quote unquote, set in and clean, you know, yeah. get to push more and more, you know, but I just wanted to make sure like, you know, the waistline stays intact, you know, we're trying to keep the integrity of what got him here in the first place. Yeah. And so ironically, we're not rushing it, even though he's putting on muscle like drastically every year, we're not, ironically, we're not trying to rush it. And I feel that again, he keeps his whistles and bells, you know, his, the, the midsection and the, and the, you know, the, um, the vacuum, there's so many things that we want to keep as him, you know, and therefore, like, we're not trying to, like, you know, rush it, although we could have. So I think for next year, though, you'll see, you know, I think <laughs> probably going to be like how it was with the USA, how it was a trouble making the middleweights. I can see that happen. <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me ask you this, guys. So, you know, you, you mentioned some things that I think are reminiscent of, what we look for in classic bodybuilding, you know, tiny waist guys that are able to pull vacuums. You got the round sweeping quads, beautiful shapes. How far off are you from being able to train or compete in the classic division? Would that, would that even potentially be an interest or an option? Well, is this is that, um, when I turn 50, maybe <laughs> why is I that? Can't squat anymore. Yeah. Why is that now? Why, why is your thought on that? Uh, well, I mean, I guess I can be pretty open and candid. Um, yeah, yeah. All those guys doing classic, they should go to two twelves. I don't know what they're afraid of. It's pretty simple. You feel like so? So what is it? That, what's the difference in your mind? Well, like, I mean, sorry, to cut off. But I mean, yeah. if you look at like, I mean, it's we're talking about there's some freaky body parts. Like, you know, he's got freaky two twelve muscle, but with like a classic dimension. You know. Yeah, which I think is what makes it dangerous. I think the reason why we're doing the T12 is because, you know, I mean, he's got some of the best legs in the IPB, open or T12, his back, everything, all these body parts are just getting freaky, yet he retains that classic lines. And I think, again, that's what makes him uh, dangerous as in the T12. And it sounds like, Daniel, you just have an interest in, in still putting on as much muscle as you possibly can. You don't want to limit yourself. Yeah, because with my height, my weight limit, I would already, I wouldn't make weight right now. Oh, okay. Uh, and I still yeah. have a lot more size to, to put on me. So when I look at that, I look at the guys in that division who are limiting themselves. Because I've put on in the last two years, I've put on about 20 pounds of tissue. And I still have a 29-inch waist. Right now, if I measured it when I vacuum in, we're at 29. So I've put on an inch in two years with 20 pounds. It's doable, but nobody wants to put in the work to do it correctly. Nobody wants to take the time to do it. So that division to me seems like the easy out for a lot of the middleweights and lightweights who just don't want to, you know, take their time. Right on. Is that something that you've had to do any kind of special work with on your waist or is it something that has just retained itself? Um, a little bit of both. It's retained itself, but it's also something that I'm aware of. You have to be cognizant of how much stuff you're putting into your system, mm-hmm. how much you're eating, and monitor all that. You can't – like I eat a lot, and I, I eat junk food all the time, but it's in small portions. It's not anything crazy. Okay. So part of that is that you're not, you're not distending it out. You're not pushing it out. Oh, no. I got to walk around looking great all day. That's my job. Got to <laughs> suck it in. So it, do you practice vacuums? Do a lot of core training? Uh, what's what's your, your philosophies around your core? I actually hate training abs, but I think a lot of it is the, the cheerleading. The, the tumbling and gymnastics oh. and stuff. I think a lot of it naturally comes from that. Um, it's a lot of indirect core, so I'm doing that stuff all the time. Plus, you know, you don't want to walk around with your gut hanging out, so I'm always flexing it to make sure it looks good in my shirts. That's a good point, man. Yeah. 
And also, like, I mean, gear-wise, keep in mind, like, again, going back to wanting to keep the waist high, you know, we're not pushing, like, tons and high crazy doses of androgens where he's getting that visceral buildup. Yeah. You know, where there's no, like, crazy insulin protocols and cramming in tons of intra and post You know, we're not doing that inflammation blow-up shit, yeah. you know, um, for all the above reasons. Dave, do you feel like uh, do you feel like guys that do get that that distension, that inflammation, is that something that can be reversed, or do you feel like once you got it, you're stuck with it? Well, insulin and sensitivity is a motherfucker, you know. I mean, it can be reversed, but again, like you know, a lot of times when you see a lot of these guys where they lose the subcutaneous fat, but that visceral fat is not there, so you see like surface vascularity, but you don't see the deep separation on stage, and you see you know, the midsection that's blown out. I mean, it can be reversed over time, but I mean, again, it's like you, again, I think when these guys be doing like tons and tons of, of androgens um, and you are having trouble like with your glucose tolerance levels because there's tons of insulin being used mm. and all this, then I think that you get that stubborn visceral fat that's, you know, the midsection mostly. And, you know, you can, you can see it like where that's in the stomach's hard to control, and there's inflammation, and it can be reversed over time. But I mean, it's you know, I mean, I'm not saying you can't unring a bell, but I mean, there's some guys who have literally like you know pushed out their obliques, whatever. Yeah. And you can bring down those levels, but like you know, those obliques have to eventually they have to atrophy, and then you have to make sure that you are very visceral, fat wise, you died it off, you know, and it's going to be more stubborn and more difficult. But it, it can be worked on. It can be reversed. How does training play a role in uh, keeping his waist tight? Well, I mean, he mechanically trains really, really well. I mean, when he squats, he's not doing like he's not squatting from his but like he's he's not he's not powerlifting. I mean, he's done powerlifting, but he's not these movements. He's you know he's not lifting like a powerlifter. That makes sense. So he's not like you know like a lot of powerlifters. Let's say they'll come down and they'll they'll squat off of the extended belly. Like he's not blowing out yeah. his transverse abdominals and obliques. He's he's taking them out of the movement and he's how do I say it? He's squatting or deadlifting or whatever mechanically correct where he's not you know using uh you know secondary muscles to assist and blowing that whole thing out um if you want to call it he's doing bodybuilding squats or bodybuilding deadlifts so be it yeah but though the former technique is mechanically correct where he's a trying to avoid injury because he's, he's daniel train's very smart and b he's not trying to again involve those transverse abdominals obliques in these movements you know and so i think he's getting great development because he, he his form is really, really good. He's not bouncing and snapping and, you know, he gets great control over the muscle when he trains. There's a great control negative when he trains. Um, he's explosive without locking out and stuff. And, I mean, except for some bicep tendon tendonitis and stuff, he's been remarkably pretty much injury-free. Um, we're trying to keep it that way. I mean, we talked about he's got some old football injuries that are linger here and there and some gymnastic stuff. But, I mean, for the most part, He's, he trains smart, and I think that he does progressive stress loads on his muscles, and they they react and not like again the midsection and all that stuff. And and he's not training all inflamed like all these guys when they're like filled up with tons of carbs and intramuscular insulin, whatever intra workout insulin, and you're trying to do these movements. Then I think you you get more blown out in the midsection and all that. And that's mm. not happening here. Okay, legs have always been something that's been it's been a standout body part as far as I've seen from you, Daniel. Has that always been a strong group for you, or is that something that you've had to put a lot of work to to, to get them where they are today? Um, both. I mean, when I first started working out, I was little. I weighed about 98 pounds oh, first time okay. I worked out. All right. So very little kid. So I had to put in the work, but as far as like bodybuilding, I haven't because they're, the legs are already developed. Um, when I was playing football, we did squats three times a week. That was just our team's protocol. So for four years in high school and a year in college, I squatted three times a week. And it wasn't baby squats. It was ego lifting, shit talking, the boys <laughs> yelling at you, ass to grass squats. So I developed really big legs. Um, they've actually shrunk shit. They're like 30-inch legs now. They used to be 33, 34 no when I first started. And they've, they've shrunk because I've just trained them once a week or once a month. And they've started to match the rest of my body. But so I put in a lot of work early in my career to have the legs to answer the question. But now yeah. I just kind of maintain them. What uh, what advice would you give to the guys out there that are trying to grow their legs? Because it is a stubborn body part for so many people. 
<laughs> if it's, I guess it would depend on their age. If they're younger and their joints can handle it, you need a squat. You, you, I know it's a, it's a bad lift. I know there's a lot of detrimental shit down the road, but if you want the legs, if you want the size, then you have to squat. You got to do your deep squats, go heavy. Um, Dave will tell you there's a couple of times he's trained me where we don't really start the workout till after I throw up. That's when my <laughs> legs are warmed up. You yeah. go throw up a little bit, you get right back out there and you, you finish the workout. Um, I don't need to do that as much now, but when I first started, you better believe that was, that was every day was drop sets from six plates oh, to another set of drop sets from six plates. And then you can go do your extensions then you go do your hamstring curls. Then huh. you can rest a little bit. You know what I mean? There's times where I've taken a nap in between my workouts at the gym where I'll just go lay in the corner, sleep for 20 minutes and then go back to the leg workout. Cause I'm tired. That's, that's just how you train your legs. No kidding. Anything you want to add to that, Dave? No, I mean, you know me and about the bread and butter stuff. I mean, people will find every excuse in the world not to squat. And, like, you know what? It's like you can uh, – I mean, you got – I'm sorry to sound so old school, but you got to squat. I mean, you really, like – you know, people try to – you know, like, there's there's just a certain look. There's great leg machines out there. Don't get me wrong. Um, and these all these machines can play a role. But to me, it's just the bread and butter. I mean, I'm not just trying to say it just to, for the sake of old school, but it's like – I mean, it just does something different. There's mm-hmm. something about, and it's even different from Smith machine squats. There's something about having to balance the bar and just these, you know, you involve more, you just involve so much more of the leg. It's, I mean, the, there's so much more involvement with legs, glutes, and hands. it just creates the, it's just, I don't know, it's the bench press for the lower body, what could I say? Right and I just think like you're, I mean, 90, uh, I don't know what the percentage would be, but like you can't get freaky legs and progress their growing Unless you're squatting. I mean, it really, there's going to be, have, like as Daniel was saying, if you're young, your joints can handle it. There's going to have to be a phase where you like, it's going to be like, okay, for the next fucking 45 minutes, we're going to squat, where you like sit down, you wrap and you use your belt. I mean, like, and you're sitting there and it's like, you know, a set of 135, two sets of two, like you, you need to be like, okay, we're going to squat for the next 45 minutes an hour. And it's going to suck and there's going to be nausea and like you're nervous because you know, the weight's going up and your training partner's pushing you. But like, that's how it should be. Like, mm. uh, there should be like the day before legs. You should be like nervous. <laughs> you should be like, fuck, tomorrow's fucking legs. In your mind, knowing you should almost be, I'm not saying losing sleep over it, but you should almost be losing sleep over it, knowing that the next day you're going to go in there and it's going to be uncomfortable as fuck. But you have to be progressive with the squat. Um, you have to either use more weight um, with the same amount of reps or you have to be using more reps, you know, doing more reps with the same amount of weight. Either way, there's got to be a progression on the stress load and then lo and behold, you'll start seeing, you know, the gains in your, your legs. Hmm. It's going to take a long time though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then in addition to that, too, yeah. it's, I was going to say everybody's got their injuries too, but um, yesterday was my leg day, my, my quad day. And um, I've had two knee surgeries. You know, my back hurts. I'm old. You know, I've been squatting a little bit, so you get your boo-boos, but yesterday my body wasn't really feeling too hot. So we ended up doing four sets of 30 with three plates that still feels just as bad as going to five plates, six plates. So yeah. people just need to be able to adjust on the fly too. I feel like a lot of people, when they feel a little kink in their knee or their back, they just stop. They go, oh, I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to shut it down. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you wrap it out then until you feel nauseous right. and lightheaded? Cause that's going to tear your legs up a little bit too and not put any more pressure on your back and your knees. Figure yeah, out a way to get a cat. Yeah. Yeah. I like more that. Than one, more than one way to skin a cat. What's your recovery like on a on a leg day like that, Daniel? So you you get in there, you do you do these crazy, we'll say really heavy sets or even these higher rep sets. Uh, I'm sure you're feeling it the next day. How long until you're actually feeling like you recovered from something like that? Uh, off season or on, not not off season? That does make a difference. Does yeah, my leg day are a lot less violent. Like yesterday was a lot less violent than off season, but. Like right now, my legs are sore, but I'm not useless. Um, it was a good one. Got a good pump. Then we posed for 30 minutes afterwards. So that was part of the leg workout was just doing lower body posing. Um, during the off season, when I'm actually doing a two-hour workout, um, I pretty much can't sit down to take a shit without falling for two or three days. Okay. So it's about normal, and that's even with the high calories, and that's with the resting. Um, they, they fucking hurt for a little bit. And then how uh, how much space will you have before that next leg day then? Uh, usually because my legs are good, I'll only squat maybe twice a month. And then the other leg day is like a leg press um, kind of day. 
So my squatting days, I take another like week and a half off, but in that gap, I'll do a, a normal leg day okay. just once a week. Okay. So in that case, then, you know, we're talking about legs being one of your strengths and you've brought everything up, you know, obviously putting on 20 pounds, that's a huge jump. Uh, what's been the hardest muscle group for you to bring up this past couple of years? <laughs> my back. Back has been a pain in my ass. And what have you guys done to to make that grow? Because it's obviously improved. Yeah, man. That, now it's like one of his better body parts. Um, yeah. Just, I mean, he does deadlifts. He does rows. He's he's able to, I think now, the last year or two, he's able to now mechanically involve, like use you know, the scapula flexion and contraction as opposed to just moving, using arms and shoulders to move the weight from point A to point B. He's just his, his technique is really improved. I think he's really like he's excuse the expression mind to muscle, but you know he's strong too. So if you're improving your form, you know, and you're and there's more you're placing more of a stress load, you're going to get you know the results. So he, I mean, he's picking off he's picking heavy weights off the floor. He's doing heavy rows. He's doing everything mechanically that's needed, and now he has really, he's executing really good form. So again, he's uninvolving you know the you know the brachialis muscle and you know shoulders involved with a lot of people that when they row. He's using his back more, and you can just literally see when he's doing these exercises, like he's just hmm. recruiting more back muscle. Yeah, I mean, you could just see it mechanically happening. Are you feeling it now, Daniel? You feeling it differently than you had a couple of years ago? Yeah, more so now. I mean, when Dave and I first started working together, what has it been? Five years now, six years. Yeah, you know, it's, I can still hear him in the back of my mind every time I do back. Like, you need to open your scapula, you need to pull back, you need to pull hmm. back, and just like we were talking about with legs being one of my better body parts, it took years of our coaches yelling at us too, to do it correct, to make sure your head's up, chest up. It's just a practice thing over time. And unfortunately I got into this later. So I'm finally at a point now where I actually think I have kind of a back. This still has some room to grow and some improvements to make still, but this is the best it's ever looked. And every year we say that, which means every year it's getting a little bit easier for me to squeeze it a little bit easier to contract it. We were doing back twice a week for a little bit a couple of years ago, and then we went back to doing it once a week. And I think that helped just give me more reps mentally, doing it more often, and then going to the once a week to give it more recovery time to actually get a little thicker. Oh, that makes sense. Now, what, what would you say is your, your strongest back movements? Like, what do you really like? What, what have you really connected to mind-muscle-wise for your back training? Actually, I started doing, I got this from Seth Ferrasi a while ago, where he does his 100 pull-ups before every back day. No kidding. Huh. So every day before back, I would, I'll do 100 pull-ups. Um, not straight. I wish I was that strong, but I'll do, <laughs> I'll do five sets of 20, just get my 100 pull-ups done, and then I'll start my back workout. And ever since I've been doing that, it really opens everything up. It stretches everything. It's blood moving in the right direction. So then the rest of the movements, the rest of the day, just feel, they feel good. You already have blood there. You don't have to worry about getting your pump now. Your body just goes. Okay. So let's see now. So last year at Legion, you managed to get into the top five. Obviously, you're looking to improve on that and, you know, ideally win this show this year. What, what did the judges tell you last year that you needed to work on most? Upper body thickness. Yeah. Yeah, upper body thickness, not fading throughout the show. Um, make sure my chest stays a little fuller from from start of prejudging to end of prejudging. Uh, bring the back up, bring the arms up. You now make everything match the bottom, pretty okay. much. Okay, and it sounds like that you guys have done that. Yeah. Now, I, I, is there is there a list to tell us like who's come, going in this show yet? I mean, I know we know some of the people, but I mean, how do, how does that work? We're fine. <laughs> We use Instagram. You, you kind of see who's doing it, but um, a friend of mine, Charles, is doing it, and he actually took he got his pro card the year I took third in the oh, middle no. weights, and I've oh, competed no. against him a couple of times. Guys. Guys. He yeah, I competed him. I've competed with him a couple of times in other shows when we were both amateurs, and then um, so I'm excited to compete with him. He's going to be a really good competitor. Um, there's a couple <laughs> other guys that are. Mike. That, come from Romania to do this show. So mm. we'll see who comes because the Romania show is uh, a week before it. Mm, okay. okay. What were we going to say, Dave? No, it's interesting. Um, getting back to uh, Charles. So when Daniel got third in, uh, 90, in 2000, 2016, so Charles Curtis won the middleweights. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, Daniel got third, but uh, it was uh, Derek 
once we got second. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the following year, so the following year, you got to realize, so Derek went up to light heavyweight, won the overall, and then Daniel won middleweights. So it's kind of like a little rematch between uh, Daniel and Charles here. It should be interesting. That'll be fun, man. That'll be cool. Well, Charles was, was classic. Charles went to classic after he got his pro card. He actually did Legion's last year as classic. Okay. And now he's going to do the uh, 212. All right. I think I feel like Dave. Overall, you 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 would support everybody moving up, moving up to two twelve, and then you, you eventually see you eventually see open in this guy's in this guy's future. Do you see what? Do you eventually see open in this guy's future, or you think you'll be able to do everything you oh, need I to? Think, in um, I think you'll see. Um, it's my prediction that you'll see over the next year. You'll start to see Daniel as a fixture in the two uh, twelve, um, the upper. You'll. I think there's a lot of good things that are going to. I don't want to jinx it, but I think... Uh, no, of course not. I think uh, you're going to see some remarkable shit happening over the next few years. Right on. You guys have any other plans besides Legion? Yeah, the cigar... The Olympia. Olympia. Yeah, exactly. The Olympia. And what, what else did you say, Dave? <laughs> uh, celebration cigar slash shot of Jameson and discussing, fingers crossed, Olympia prep for next year. That's, <laughs> uh, that's the goal for a couple weeks from now. Yep. Right on. Nothing other than that. I heard, uh, yeah, I watched uh, a while ago, I think it was, uh, after you won uh, your your pro card. I remember that's what you said. You guys are going to celebrate with cigars after that. So, yeah. something, something along those lines. So uh, anything else we should mention here, Dave, while uh, while we got Daniel on the line? No, oh, man, I'm proud of this. He uh, worked his ass off. I mean, this year it's been, uh, I mean, he really couldn't ask any, anything more out of him, you know. Um, I'm also, you know, he's, he runs, he's also like, you have to understand while he's doing all this, you know, he's not sleeping all day. I mean, he's working his ass off at the gym. He's taking this gym and he manages it. He's got like a whole slew of people that are working under him. And I go there to check on him a couple times a week and I'm seeing what he's doing. And it's pretty impressive how he's like literally like running this club and keep in mind, this is not a normal crunch. This is the most populated crunch there is of all the crunches in the chain. You're kidding. Uh, it's not easy to run these clubs and no. it's very demanding. There's a lot of different personalities you got to deal with, whatever. So, you know, he, it's pretty amazing that he's juggling both. I got, I got to give him credit for that. And I think, um, just shows what kind of, you know, work ethic he has. So, yeah. Pretty cool. That's a good point. It takes a lot of dedication to be able to, to be able to have the focus just to do bodybuilding and then maintain like real life on top of that, that, uh, it definitely yeah. does say a lot. There's no question. All right. Well, I think we about covered it then. Daniel, anything else that we're missing here that we should talk about? No, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of excited. It's the first time I've ever done like a little podcast thing. So it's kind of cool. Uh, um, well, we're happy to have you. No, I, I, I like this. I like being able to talk about the whole process of everything. And it's been a fun journey. And like Dave said, it's it's kind of cool because uh, I pride myself a lot in actually having to work uh I'll use air quotes to be respectful to other people, but a real job. Yeah. I don't just train a couple clients a day and, and then go sleep all day. I don't have a sponsor paying for everything. And you know, I work 14 hours a day, six days a week, and I run the busiest crunch in the entire U S so it's, it gets annoying sometimes, but I think that's what pushes me to be better than everybody else because a lot of people get a lot of guys, nice little hand-me-downs from uh, other companies. So that said, we'll keep winning. We'll that keep, said, we'll if, you want, if you want to sponsor Daniel, reach out to him. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that I'm sure you'd take it. But nonetheless, you know, get a good sponsorship oh, going. Can tell people you they can get in touch with you, man. Absolutely. But other than that, no, I'm excited. I, I'm I'm ready to see what we look like in four weeks, and I'm really hoping that we can do another one of these as we're prepping for the Olympia. That'd be that would be kind of the dream. I'll come in full circle. Hell yeah. Uh, if you were to give any advice then, you know, to the guys out there that are listening and watching the show, um, you know, I feel like you already have, you've given some good advice about, you know, trying to continue to grow. Don't cut yourself short, but uh, what would be a take home message? You know, you, you have an opportunity here to, to share with a bunch of people out there that are into bodybuilding. The biggest thing I, I see that bothers me is um, for lack of a better word, we'll use coach hopping. Um, the kids coming up, even the adults coming up, y'all need to trust the process. Y'all need to trust the people who are letting you know what to do and, and actually just do it. A lot of people try to change protocols, change foods, change cardio, 
And then they get mad when they don't get the result. And it's like, well, you didn't do what you were asked. So that's my biggest thing of advice is trust the process. If you're, if you're willing to let someone do your stuff for you, you need to trust everything that they're doing for you and it'll work every time. Oh yeah. So if, uh, uh, as Dave just mentioned a second ago, if people do want to reach out to you, if those potential sponsors want to reach out, where's the, where's the best way for people to find you and what's your Instagram and everything else? Um, my Instagram is, uh, IFBB pro underscore Dan Dan. And that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. That's pretty much the only social media that I use right now. Right on. Well, I think you've got a freaking killer physique, man. The condition that you brought, we haven't even really talked about your condition, but the condition that you bring, I mean, realistically, I, it's, it's fantastic. And I feel like that that's, that's what you really need to be able to have in the 212, you know, looking at like what the guys did in the Olympia this year. The guys who did the best were the guys that were the crispest, you know, and yeah. I think we're, we're, incredible. Who did? Yeah, we're putting a uh, put condition first. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, that said, man, we're wishing you the best of luck over here. We'll definitely all be following along. And I would love to have you on again to uh, to, to wrap this thing up and talk about how the show went. Soon. Sure. Uh, yeah, let's make it happen. I'm, I'm, I'm down. All right, guys. For another episode of Advices Radio and Think Big Bodybuilding Media, we've got Dave Kalick and IFBB Pro Daniel Alexander. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, Thanks for having us. Appreciate it.